Turn in your Bibles tonight, if you will, please, to the book of Isaiah. When you find the book of Isaiah, turn to chapter number 33. Tonight I'm doing different than I normally do on Wednesday. We've been, we've been teaching a series on Wednesday night in the book of Genesis. But tonight I want to speak to us about the 4th of July. And I want to read one verse of Scripture tonight. Isaiah chapter 33, verse number 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Let's have a word of prayer just before... I begin tonight. Brother Tripp, would you pray for us, please? I used to, in uh, high school, listen very attentively to what my teachers would say when they walked in the classroom. One teacher especially, if he came in the classroom and he said, put your books away, I knew one of two things was going to happen. Things were going to be good or things was going to be bad. I can hear him say right now, put your books away. It was my English teacher. Put your books away. Get out a pencil and a piece of paper or a notebook. And he'll say something like this. I have, I have five statements I'm about to make. Five questions I'm going to ask, and I want you to answer this pop quiz. It got to where when he said pop quiz, I thought he was cussing me. That's what it felt like. That's what it sounded like. Now, it didn't bother me if I had been studying and doing my work, but it really bothered me when I had not studied the material. If I had paid attention in the classroom, I was known to pay attention, and I was known not to pay attention. I feared the pop test. If I had a, a grasp of the material, then bring it on. It don't bother me. If I should give a pop quiz tonight, I will not, I will not ask you to answer, but if I would give a pop quiz tonight about what brought about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. If I should ask us tonight, what events in history was portrayed that would bring such a great group of minds together to decide that we should separate from another country to start our own country. Sad to say it's not taught today. But I think it's important that we get at least a basic substructure of, of the events that took place that brought about the first of two great signings in this country that set us apart from every other nation in the history of the world. No other nation, I want to say it again in a little different way, no other nation in the history of the world 
has ever had two documents like the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. No nation, there is not another nation in the world that has had the language, that has had the freedom tied to it that these two great documents had in place. The Declaration of Independence was such a great document that John Adams said that it should be celebrated every year as long as there is a United States of America. On July the 3rd, 1776, John Adams wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail. Much that we know about our history surrounding July the 4th and surrounding events in that arena comes to us from the letters that John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail, and Abigail wrote back to him. They were proficient letter writers. Practically every day of his life, John Adams wrote a letter to his wife. She kept the letters. Abigail practically every day wrote a letter back to John Adams. That's the main reason uh, as to why we know what happened. Because they gave us a historical documentation blow by blow, by blow daily account of what was going on in this country. And so on July the 3rd, 1776, he wrote to his wife Abigail and stated how he hoped that this nation would respond to the signing of the Declaration of Independence in its perpetuity. And here's what he said. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. John Adams knew and our forefathers around him knew that there could be no Declaration of Independence and what it asked this country to do without the divine providence of God. And before I go any farther, I want to be very quick to say it was God's interceding blessings that brought about the foundation of this great nation. Our forefathers knew that. They knew they did not have the ingenuity. They knew that they did not have the wherewithal. We certainly did not have the military. I mean, this was all new to us. The worst thing some, some of the people on the front lines fighting the British knew was how to uh, fight a wild animal out in the forest somewhere. We didn't have uh, an army, uh, didn't have a navy. I mean, we, as far as fighting a, a battle, we never been trained to do that. And yet we recognize that the very minute we signed this Declaration of Independence, that the moment that was signed, I want you to listen to this statement. The moment that was signed, every signer was without a country. They had to build a country. They had to fight to establish a country. They just separated from a country to hopefully begin a country that would be successful. And John Adams said on the day of July the 4th, it ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to Almighty God. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, with games, with sports, with guns, with bells, with bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. 
He said, now this is such a great event. There ought to be a yearly celebration tagged to it. That's what we do tonight. That's what we do tomorrow. You will be hearing in your homes. You'll be hearing all kinds of noises taking place. Because people will be celebrating the 4th of July. We continue to do that. We still do that. We're the only nation in the world that has the right to do that because our forefathers fought and won that right and handed that right to us to celebrate our freedom. We have something to celebrate when we celebrate our freedom. Then John Adams made this statement. You will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I'm not. I am well aware of the toil and the blood and the treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all of the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is more, is worth more than all of the means. Now, what really brought this about? Well, we look back, we read, we study, we listen, and we realize that all reconciliation with England had been exhausted. I would encourage you, if you do not have a copy of the Declaration of Independence, to go online and read the Declaration of Independence. If you've never read the Declaration of Independence, you'd be surprised at what is inscribed in that precious, powerful document. Because when we look at the Declaration of Independence, they list a minimum of 27 reasons why we separated from England. Now it's important that we understand that those 27 reasons why we separated from England had been the messages that the preachers for several years had been preaching in the colonies. They preached 27 reasons why this country should have its independence from England. And they kept preaching that. They preached it in their pulpits. They preached it on the street corners. And much, as we'll learn in just a minute if I have time, much of the information that was inscribed, much of the information that was inscribed in the Declaration of Independence was the information that they had been preaching into the churches of that generation. Now, I want to give you tonight eight or ten reasons why they said in the Declaration of Independence we must separate from England. They sent this to King George. And here is inscribed some of the statements they made to the king. Number one, he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of the legislators for cutting off our trade with other parts of the world for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. What's happening with Donald Trump is not the first time this has happened. It was happening in these days of our Declaration of Independence for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, altering fundamentally the forms of our government. He has plundered our seas, 
He has ravaged our coast. He has burned our towns and destroyed the lives of our people. Now those are just eight of about 27 grievances contained in the Declaration of Independence. You go online, look it up, you can read all of them. Therefore, in the closing words of our Declaration of Independence, I want you to hear this. In the closing words of our Declaration of Independence, this was set forth. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. That's a powerful statement. They said this tyrant in King George, who's putting all of this pressure on us, taking away our freedoms that we sought to hold dear, he's a tyrant. And he's unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Therefore, in closing out the Declaration of Independence, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from the allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, con conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which indep independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, in other words, here's where we stand. We do not move from this position with a firm reliance on the protect, protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. These men meant business. We will not continue to live under this oppression, they said. We have tried. We have sent ambassadors. Even George Whitfield went before the legal authorities of England and tried to preach in their presence that they should give freedom to these 13 colonies. But they made fun, they rejected, and continued to threaten to bring the armed forces of England to this nation and bring the 13 colonies into subjection to the crown. Some great men whom we revere placed their signatures on that declaration knowing the consequences of what they did. Fortunately, here in the state of North Carolina, we had three men who stepped up and they said, we'll put our name on that Declaration of Independence. First man was Mr. William Hooper. The second man was Mr. Joseph Hughes. And the third individual who dared to step up and knowing the consequences that it could cost them everything they possessed, Mr. John Penn stepped to the plate and knocked the ball out of the park. 
Another man who's well known put his name on the Declaration of Independence. And we've heard about him down through the years. And his name, of course, was John Hancock. If you get a copy of the Declaration of Independence, you will see, you will, see, you will find that the largest signature on the bottom of the Declaration of Independence was the signature of John Hancock. John Hancock said, as he signed the Declaration of Independence, I want my name so large on this declaration that when King George views it, he will not have to put on his spectacles to read my name. That's the reason you hear people today say when it's time to place your signature on a document, they will say, place your John Hancock here. That means sign it large and legible. Another man from the state of Virginia, whom we here have heard so much about, was Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson was the individual who, in response to the Danbury Baptists, talked about the separation of church and state, which has certainly been taken out of context. Because when Mr. Jefferson, they came to Mr. Jefferson and they said, Mr. Jefferson, do we have any God-given rights, any inalienable rights? And the reason he made the statement was some of the northern colonies was trying to establish a state religion. And some of the pastors had already been put in jail. And so they wrote to the president, January of 1702, and they raised the question, do we have any God-given rights? And he wrote back to them and said, Congress shall establish no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof, thus establishing a wall of separation between church and state. He never said anything in there. Nothing was said in that statement that would preclude someone to believe that you have to leave your personal convictions politically outside the church door when you come inside to worship. That was not what he said at all. He said that on Friday. You've heard me tell this story. He said that on Friday, 1702, first day in January, first Friday of January. On Saturday, he was getting ready to worship. And on Sunday, he mounted his horse and he rode 1.6 tenths of a mile to the United States Capitol building in Washington, D.C. We're from about 1798 to 1860 or thereabouts. The largest church in Washington was housed inside of the United States Capitol building. If he meant on Friday that there's a separation between church and state, if that's what he really meant, he would, have not, he would not have gone inside of a building two days later, paid for by taxpayers' money, and worshipped. He didn't like the music. He brought in the United States Marine Corps Band, and they played the hymns of the faith. The church was growing so fast, their average attendance in the United States Capitol building was 2,000 people per Sunday. They ran out of hymn books. Congress allocated money to purchase hymn books for them to sing out of. So they're worshipping in a building paid for by taxpayers' money. They're listening to music whose salary those people play in the music is paid for by taxpayers' money and they're singing out of hymn books paid for by taxpayers' money. I don't think he meant separation church and state. He was a great man. And then there was a great hero that signed the Declaration of Independence. Maybe you've heard about, maybe you haven't. Great man. His name was Thomas, was Thomas Nelson <coughs> Jr. Thomas Nelson Jr. Jr. <coughs> placed his signature. Thomas Nelson replaced Thomas Jefferson as governor of the state of Virginia. And Thomas Nelson was raised in a very affluent environment. His family was well-to-do. He came up taught how to live, taught how to, what to do. 
But during the revolution, Thomas Nelson became a brigadier general on the lower end of the Virginia militia. He gave of his personal wealth to help fight the British. As a matter of fact, historians have taught us that when he died, he pretty much died a pauper, although he would have been some of the wealthy of the wealthiest. But he recognized there's a cause. And he gave most of what he possessed away to fight the Revolutionary War so that you and I can sit here tonight and enjoy this. But he was a great military leader. He was involved in the final siege of Yorktown. And he was standing up on a little knoll looking at his own beautiful two-story house. And it so happened that British, British General Cornwallis had set up his private office in the home of Thomas Nelson. Thomas Nelson ordered the troops to cannonball his own house. And they did. Here's a man who believes that whatever it cost, we must have our freedom. And they cannonballed his own house. Thomas Nelson was a great patriot. The United States of America is a nation of exceptionalism. We're exceptional to any other nation in the world. We're exceptional because of the documents that we've had. We're exceptional in that since, 19, uh, since 1776, we have had no revolution. Uh, we've had marchings in the street. On one occasion, we've had people storming uh, our Capitol building. Of course, Donald Trump's got blame for that. He had nothing to do with it. He asked Nancy Pelosi before he gave his speech if he'd like to bring in uh, troops to make sure everything was protected, and she said no. But he gets the blame for it. We've had nothing like the revolution of 1776. Other nations around the world, they've had all kinds of revolutions and they've been taken over. They've had constitutional changes. We're fortunate, we, we haven't experienced that. We're exceptional in that we've never had to experience it. We find something else that makes us, and I'm finishing. Believe it or not, I'm finishing. We find something else that makes us an exceptional nation. You will never find a document in any other nation of the world in its foundation, in its beginning, that uses the phrase inalienable rights. But you find it in the Declaration of Independence. That's what makes us exceptional. What does inalienable rights mean? It simply means they are rights that cannot be taken away from us. And they cannot be taken away from us because they are God-given rights. And he, those who put together the Declaration of Independence said that these inalienable God-given rights which cannot be taken away from us cannot be taken away from us because life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness doesn't come from our government, doesn't come from our Congress, doesn't come from our Supreme Court, doesn't come from our president. Life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness are inalienable rights that are given to us from God. Therefore, no man can take them from us. And they spelled it out in the Declaration of Independence. And I will say this lastly, and I got five more pages. I will say this lastly. We are an exceptional nation because our Declaration of Independence talks about, I want you to hear me, this is vitally important. Our Declaration of Independence talks about the consent of the governed. 
we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, of course, the pursuit of happiness, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, I want you to get a hold of that. No other nation in the world has that language in their foundational documents. No other nation in the world can say what our forefathers said, that those in authority get their power not from the king, but they get their power from the regular, normal people who make up the United States of America. Those people in Congress, those people in the House of Representatives, those people who are senators... They don't get their power from government. They get their power from you and I and the, and the citizens of the United States of America. That's the reason we need term limits because they get up there, they make a profession out of it, they make lifetime commitments up there, they soon forget who they are, they soon forget the people they're supposed to represent. Our forefathers said that those people up there receive their powers from the consent of the governed. That means our Declaration of Independence says, when you go up there, you remember you represent the people back home. You don't represent the president, first of all. You don't represent the other people in Congress, first of all. You represent the people who went to the ballot box and put you up there. And most of them, sad to say, when they get up there, they forget who, whom they represent. We are a constitutional republic. We are not a nation directed by a king. And when that day comes, we got, look, our text verse. Right here is where the separation of powers came from. When our, when our forefathers put together three branches of government. They came across this one day, it's God's word. For the Lord is our judge. That's our court. The Lord is our lawgiver. That's our legislative branch. The Lord is our king. That's our president. And our forefathers was reading the Bible one day and they came across that passage of scripture and they put in place three branches of government. And each, each one of those branches is supposed to mind their own business and do exactly what they were put in place to do, keep their hands out of the other side and one of the shames and disgraces, I don't care what your politics is, it don't matter to me, I don't care a rip what your politics is, but I care, I care about this country. And this week, after the United States Supreme Court ruled, came down with, with, with the rulings about our president, the current president of the United States went before the people of the United States of America, he couldn't stand there and make a statement without reading it off of a teleprompter, and put down one of the executive branches of our government, the United States uh, Supreme Court. My friend, that's a disgrace. If it had been a liberal verdict, the liberals would have been shouting all over uh, Washington, D.C., and they would not be asking for us to change our court and pack it with a bunch of liberals. But the first time something comes down they don't like, they act like a bunch of crybabies. God help us. We've got three branches. Each one is to balance the other. And if one gets out of balance, the other two have been put in place by the ingenuity, by the wisdom that God gave our forefathers, bring everything back to center so that we can continue. We have continued nearly 250 years because of the three branches of government. And it works good when, it's wor when they work it. We, got to, we have to pray that on November the 5th, uh, we do the right thing so that our government can keep functioning. We're bankrupt. Are you aware of the fact that we are bankrupt as a nation? Oh, I got to stop. Good night. Uh, so much. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. If you need to come tonight, if you have a need, uh, would you make your way down uh, we, to, the, we're to the altar? Father, thank you tonight for the nation. Thank you for the freedoms that we hold here. 
Oh God, continue to keep your blessings upon us in Jesus' name. If anyone needs to come, one, one stanza, would you come? Heavenly Father, as we celebrate this wonderful event, we just want to take a moment, just lay everything else aside, and just say thank you. There's so many words we could try to construct to express our feelings. I don't think there's anything that we could construct that's greater than thank you. Thank you for for those whom you endowed with a wisdom beyond their own abilities to give us this great sacred document. Along with the Constitution that has guided us through the murky waters of wars and uprisings to this very moment to give us the enjoyment of the greatest freedoms on this planet. I pray, Lord, I ask of you tonight, oh God, please help us. Please help us. Now, Lord, as we go to partake of the food, I pray you'll bless it. We thank you for it. And bless it to the nourishment of our bodies and then fireworks, help everything to go well, be safe. Help us, Lord, to just have a wonderful fellowship and enjoy the rest of the time we have together. And by the way, Lord, I don't want to put more emphasis on this country and I put on you. We love you more than we love this country. You're our Savior. You're our Redeemer. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Bless us now as we go our ways and we'll thank you for it. Because we ask in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen.